Welcome to our Ask the Expert series for adults living with hydrocephalus and normal pressure hydrocephalus. I'm here today with Dr. Abe Mogakar, a neurologist at Johns Hopkins Hospital, and Dr. Mark Luciano, a neurosurgeon at Johns Hopkins Hospital, and they are both part of the Cerebral Fluid Center for CSF Disorders. So today we're going to talk NPH. And this is a question that I actually have been wanting to know the answer to because I was always told no on this question. And that question is, are individuals with normal pressure hydrocephalus candidates for the endoscopic third ventriculostomy or ETV procedure where they won't have to have a shunt placed? It's a good question for Dr. Luciano. <laughs> so you're right. This, this comes up a lot because it's a very different treatment doing a, uh, a endoscopic third ventriculostomy, which is a scope that goes down and makes a hole, or put a shunt in a tube. Very different treatments, and they're, they're really used for different kinds of hydrocephalus. So let, let, let's take a step back and ask, you know, how does normal pressure hydrocephalus relate to uh, the kinds of hydrocephalus? Uh, many people have heard about communicating hydrocephalus, obstructive hydrocephalus. The, the basic concept is obstructive hydrocephalus the term is used when there's an obstruction in the ventricular system, in the, in the fluid areas of the brain, usually in one area between, it's called the aqueduct, a small area between the third and fourth ventricle. That's called aqueductal stenosis or aqueductal blockage. That's the most common cause of, of obstructive hydrocephalus. Uh, communicating hydrocephalus is when the ventricles are, are completely open. That usually does mean that there's some obstruction to flow and absorption on the outside of the brain, so it's often an obstruction somewhere, but it's communicating within the ventricles. Why is, that, why is that important? It's important in the diagnostic phase and in the treatment phase. Uh, when we see a patient that has hydrocephalus, uh, large ventricles, and they have maybe the symptoms of NPH, they may have a blockage or they may not. Both of those types of hydrocephalus uh, can be a chronic hydrocephalus that occurs in adults and the elderly and causes the NPH syndrome, if you will, the NPH symptoms. Both of those types can happen. It is more likely and more frequently perhaps to be a communicating kind of hydrocephalus. But even when hydrocephalus, when NPH was first discovered, some of those patients, first described, some of those patients had an obstructive form. They had a blockage in that aqueduct. Why is it important? Because if you take fluid uh, from the back of someone who has an obstruction, uh, Conceivably, if you take enough, it could actually be a little bit dangerous and make their symptoms worse. But also, it may not tell you much about improvement because it doesn't release the fluid because the fluid's obstructed. It's, it's, it's locked up inside the brain. So the diagnosis becomes a, a different process. But importantly, the treatment can also be a different process. You can treat even a obstructed hydrocephalus when the fluid is trapped in the skull uh, with a shunt. Or you can treat a communicating hydrocephalus with a standard shunt. But if there's a blockage, the end endoscopic third ventriculostomy is really the preferred way to treat the, hy the hydrocephalus, whether it's another form of communicating hydrocephalus or in the elderly, NPH. This form is, is, is a treatment that doesn't require a shunt at all, and in a sense, allows a more natural absorption of the fluid outside the brain. So it is preferable and does work in patients who have an obstruction. So it doesn't matter if you have normal pressure hydrocephalus, or if you're in your 70s, um, or if you have congenital hydrocephalus and you're in your 20s, an ETV is an option. Is an option. There's slightly different uh, prognostic factors that increase the probability of success and so forth, but that is an option. If there's an obstruction uh, in the aqueduct or farther behind, then an uh, endoscopic procedure uh, can and should be considered. Well, and I'm going to do my due diligence as a staff person with the Hydrocephalus Association and remind everybody that if you have an endoscopic third ventriculostomy or an ETV, you still need to remember the symptoms of trouble if your ETV is not working optimally so that you can call your neurosurgeon or your neurologist and let them know ETVs can close. So while you are not shunt dependent, you still need to understand the, uh, the um, symptoms of the ETV potentially closing. I think it's great to, to, to say that because many people use the word cure after right. ETV, and hydrocephalus, unfortunately, is never cured. It, it can be controlled. It can be controlled for the lifespan and give a person an entirely normal lifespan, but it is never really cured. It's just been bypassed or drained.
Great, thank you. So I'd like to thank Dr. Mogukar and Dr. Luciano for joining us for today's segment, and thank all of you for joining us as well. And for those of you that submitted questions through Facebook for our Ask the Expert series, thank you, and we'll see you next time.